Hi there, for anyone just jumping in, we're gonna hold on for uh, one more minute and then we're gonna get started at 2 p.m. Hi everyone, uh, it is 2 p.m. so we're going to get started with our webinar here today. Uh, so welcome to the Clean Economy Alliance webinar series and thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Buchanan, I am the coordinator for the Clean Economy Alliance, which is a multi-sector coalition of over 100 organizations, including clean tech firms, health advocates, businesses, environmental groups, and labor unions from Ontario. Today, we'll be discussing Ontario's progress on tackling climate change in the first stage of the Climate Change Action Plan. So since Ontario passed the Climate Change Mitigation and Low Carbon Economy Act in 2016, Ontario has done quite a lot. They brought in carbon pricing, put a limit on greenhouse gases, legislated carbon reduction targets, and introduced a comprehensive climate plan. So today, we're aiming to answer a few key questions. Uh, one of them, is this plan working? And is there any economic fallout from cap and trade or other programs and policies in the plan? And now that we're through both the first year of carbon pricing and the first year of climate change action plan, it's a really good time to step back and take stock. Uh, we've also done this in our recent report from the Clean Economy Alliance, which I'm guessing you've probably all seen at this point because we've emailed it around. Uh, and that uh, report is called a progress report on year one of cap and trade. Uh, you can actually, if you haven't seen it yet, you can download it in your right hand panel. There's a little section called handouts and you'll see it is there as a PDF. So today we have some guests to discuss this with us, including Keith Brooks, programs director at environmental defense, Kim Parada, executive director of Canadian associations of physicians for the environment. We have Martin Vro, Senior Director, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Technologies, Ontario Centres of Excellence. And we have Nancy Pollardi, Senior Manager, Climate Change Envi Senior Manager of Climate Change at the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario's office. And we have Gabriella Kalapos, Executive Director of the Clean Air Partnership. So first up today, we're going to get an overview of the report that I just mentioned um, and some of its key conclusions with the report's author, Keith Brooks, here at Environmental Defense. After that presentation, we're going to jump to our panel discussion. Then we're going to do a quick Q&A session where you can get your questions in. So if you do have a question during the presentation, feel free to type it into the question box, which is on your right hand sidebar uh, close to that, um, that where that report is. Uh, so you can type it in any point during the presentation and then we can jump to it at the end of the um, discussion. And I also wanted to remind everyone to follow our CEA social media accounts on Twitter and Facebook if you haven't already. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Keith, I'm going to hand it over to you to give us a quick overview of the, um, of the report. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about carbon pricing and cap and trade in Ontario uh, and, and across Canada. And in Ontario, it's become more heated as we approach the provincial election. Uh, and a bunch of claims are being made about, you know, how it's working or whether it's working or whether we should keep this policy or swap it for another one. Um, you know, we wanted to get some real world data about how well cap and trade is working and what kind of an impact it's having in Ontario to inform this debate. And, and so we did some research, which is what's presented in this report and, and which, which we're going to summarize uh, for you right for you right now. Um, you know, there's been some other good uh, analysis done about the effectiveness of carbon pricing and things like that. But so far as we're aware, this is the first 
report that actually looks for empirical evidence, you know, actual impacts in Ontario of cap and trade and of the climate change action plan. And I think we've got some pretty interesting findings. Um, and I just want to say that we're really looking at not just cap and trade here, but cap and trade and the climate change action plan because they were devised to, to work in tandem. They really are a carrot and a stick approach. You've got a hard cap forcing emissions down. And then you've got a bunch of actions in the climate change action plan that are intended to help people, businesses, industries, municipalities, et cetera, you know, with the behavior changes and the things that they need to do to reduce emissions. So it's not just about a pricing signal, it's, it's about a, a, a bunch of policies working together. And we wanted to look at them in that uh, complementary, uh, comprehensive manner. I'll just one more point on the discussions because we're having so much discussion about carbon pricing in Canada uh, and it's, I think it's important to understand that so far as we know, and I've not had anybody come up and tell me otherwise, there is not a single jurisdiction anywhere in the world that is fighting climate change and driving towards science-based two degrees or 1.5 degree targets using only pricing. Nobody, nobody's doing that. And actually the report looks a little bit at California, which is, um, uh, the United States, uh, leading jurisdiction on climate change. And they've got a, an approach that's very similar to Ontario's. That's why we're linked together into the WCI, the Western Climate Initiative, because we all we both have cap and trade in place. We have a revenue positive system that spends money back into the economy to help people, to help businesses, to help industries reduce their emissions. And we have complementary policies to drive down emissions in other sectors. Uh, so anyway, just want to make that that point. And all this discussion about carbon pricing, uh, we need to remember that there needs to be other policies in place as well. Uh, okay, so the report, you know, aims to answer these these three questions. Uh, is there any evidence that cap and trade has hurt the economy or cost jobs? Is there any evidence that cap and trade and the climate change action plan have had an impact on carbon emissions? And further, how 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 is the plan progressing? Are, are, is the province following through on the commitments that it made? So to the to the first question on impacts on the economy. Is there any evidence that's hurt the economy or cost jobs? The short answer is no. Um, unemployment is down in Ontario, has continued to go down throughout uh, 2017, the first year of cap and trade, and it is below the national average. Uh, and you know, to the claims that cap and trade will kill jobs, well, we, we have evidence that suggests otherwise. Uh, in fact, uh, 2017, a really strong year for Ontario's economy, uh, economic growth was very strong. Unemployment now is at a six-year uh, low. And also you can see here 155,000 jobs, sorry, 155,000 jobs uh, were created during the first year of cap and trade. So um, the claims that it's going to kill jobs just don't seem to be borne out in the evidence. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to advance the slide here now. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Um, and, you know, it's, it's worth noting too, that it's not just Ontario, but other jurisdictions that have carbon pricing are showing strong economies. So the four provinces in Ontario that have implemented carbon pricing, Quebec, sorry, the four provinces in Canada that have implemented carbon pricing, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and BC are the same four provinces that led economic growth in 2017. And all four of those provinces are expected to have strong growth through 2018 as well. Um, you know, and it really shouldn't come as that much of a surprise that carbon pricing has not hurt the economy or not cost jobs because, um, you know, it is does raise $2 billion or so annually, but this was actually quite small in the context of Ontario's overall economy. We have an $800 billion economy, $2 billion is 0.25% of that, so a very small factor, and there's lots of other larger factors that are going to have a greater influence on Ontario's economy than than cap and trade. Um, so to the second question, has there been any impact on emissions? Um, there's quite a lag from when emissions are, are released into the atmosphere and for when they are officially reported and accounted for by industry and, and uh, by governments. In fact, the 2016 emissions data has just been released and we're going to wait another year before we see 2017. But we didn't want to wait a year to say whether or not cap and trade and the climate plan have had any impacts on emissions. We wanted to see what we could find out sooner rather than later. And, and so we, uh, we looked to fuel use. 
And fuel use is a pretty good proxy for emissions uh, because 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario, as in most other jurisdictions, are from the, the combustion of fuels. So from, from gasoline, diesel, natural gas. Um, so we looked here to sales of, of gasoline. And here you see that uh, not really much of an impact, right? A bit of a dip there uh, in Q1 of 2017, but then gasoline sales continued to, to rebound after that, uh, rising to an all-time high at the end of the year. Um, and you know this actually shows here, here the direct impact of, of carbon pricing because the pricing has actually been applied to gasoline. But again, to the point earlier about the limitations of pricing, I think we need to understand that cap and trade only added four cents to the cost of a liter of gasoline, which is, is quite small, right? And so again, claims are being made that you know gas prices are rising because of cap and trade. Well, the truth is, is, is that they, they've only risen by uh, four cents and there's been no impact on demand for fuel as a result of that increase. The story on natural gas is, is a bit different. It's actually a bit, a bit better. Uh, natural gas use climbed in the rest of Canada uh, in 2017 over 2016, but Ontario bucked the trend. Uh, industrial, uh, overall natural gas use declined in Ontario and it was driven by a decline in industrial gas use which actually dropped by 15%. Uh, it's important to note too that we, this is not because we had a, a warmer winter in 2017. In fact, we kind of looked at the degree days, which is the number of days that you need heating on, and, and we had more degree days in, uh, in 2017 than 2016. So you would expect there to be an increase in natural gas use as a result of that, and instead we saw a decrease. Um, now we can't say this is, of course, because of cap and trade. It's too early to say to say that. Maybe Martin will have some some thoughts on what industries are doing to deal with cap and trade. Um, but nonetheless, it's it's a good indicator. It, it indicates that things are headed in the right direction here in Ontario. Um, and it's also important just to to flag that this uh, decrease in industrial natural gas use. Uh, which caused an overall decrease in the province is not due to a decrease in manufacturing output or anything like that. Um, in fact, manufacturing employment grew by 4.5 percent during 2017, while emissions dropped by 15 percent. So that's a really good sign that shows that uh, the emissions intensity of of industry and of our economy on the whole is is re is being reduced. Uh, we're not sacrificing jobs for the environment. In fact, both things are tracking in the right direction. Uh, so now we went to look to see, you know, uh, how is the plan progressing? How is cap and trade progressing? How are things going? And the answer is pretty good, actually. Uh, one of the key indicators here is the auctions. The auctions went very well for the first year of auctions. You know, there had been some turbulence in the markets, uh, some some questions about the longevity of cap and trade in California and things like that, and then certainly some political uncertainty here in Ontario about the longevity of cap and trade as well. Nonetheless, the auctions went very well. 96% um, uh, of the permits available for the 2017 vintage sold and 70% of the futures sold. So if, you, if you're buying futures, that means you have uh, quite a bit of confidence that cap and trade is here to stay. And it, it looks like, like industry did. And, and these permits sold above the floor price as well. So there's a, a minimum price that permits go for around $18. Uh, a lot of these permits sold for uh, greater than that amount. So shows uh, quite a bit of, of business interest in cap and trade and in the carbon market. And, you know, worth noting too, that all these permits being sold have raised $2.4 billion. But, you know, th these companies are literally now bought into cap and trade. They literally own millions of dollars worth of permits. Um, we looked at some of the other indicators that, you know, the cap and trade, or sorry, the climate change action plan is being implemented. Um, a bit of a mixed story there. Not everything has been implemented, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, of the of the 24 actions that were supposed to have taken place in 2017, only 15 of them went forward. Um, there's one of those that's good though; it didn't go forward because in the climate change action plan, the province had been planning to subsidize electricity use, which would not have had much of, a, of an impact on emissions. So it's glad that they, or it's good that they jettisoned that action. But there's some others that didn't move forward. Home energy rating piece also is, is has been delayed. The building code has been delayed, and a few other pieces. But uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, 
but back to real world evidence that Ontario is now somehow different as a result of uh, the climate change action plan and cap and trade. We have really one one great indicator, which is electric vehicle sales uh, grew by 120% in 2017 over 2016. 2017 was the first year where Ontario sold more electric cars than any other province. Uh, Quebec still sold more on a per capita basis, but uh, first time that Ontario sold more. So another another really good indicator. Something that's really happening in the real world that shows us that Ontario is maybe looking a little bit different uh, as a result of all these policies. So that's all for my summary right now. And we can uh, answer questions about the report uh, later on when we jump into the discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so now we're going to jump over to our panel discussion. We have some wonderful panelists on uh, on hold right now. And uh, I'm going to get each panelist actually to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what they do and who they are. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, in the top left corner there with Kim. Hi, thanks, Tara. And so do you want me to make some general comments at the same time or you want me to wait till everybody's introduced themselves? Uh, sure, yeah, if you want to do some quick uh, just comments as it relates to your field of expertise, that'd be great. Sure. So um, I'm the executive director with CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. We've been working on climate change for several years. For us, the big concern is are the, the broad global health impacts and those for locally. We've been kind of positioning ourselves around um, working on climate um, sectors or areas where there can be significant health co-benefits. So for us, that means working around sustainable transportation, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable agriculture. Those are the areas where um, medical journals are telling us that we can have the greatest impact on immediate um, health co-benefits by pushing for climate solutions. And um, when I kind of look at the overall climate action plan, I mean, overall, you know, there's some very good things going on. I think for us, we're particularly interested in the transportation sector because so many of the greenhouse gases come from that sector, but also because it's a very significant source of air pollution and that highway exposures are one of the, the highest risk exposures for air pollution. It's some of the dirtiest air pollution that we have in Ontario. And so for us, when we kind of look at that kind of the actions going on around the transportation sector, I think we see the province doing some really great things. We think the places to grow where they're pushing intensification and integration with transit is terrific. We think that um, it's great that they've made some investments in cycling infrastructure. We feel like there should be more investment in public transit and that, you know, that's something that does concern us. We feel like that's really important. And then the other thing that we notice with the transportation sector is that freight emissions have really gone up greenhouse gases um, between 1990 and 2015. And this is because of just-in-time manufacturing needs, but this is a real concern for both a health perspective as well as greenhouse gases because um, freight diesel vehicles are, it's very, very nasty air pollution, very hard on human health. And it seems like that's an area that could use more attention. So I'll just leave my comments at that. And maybe just one last thing is just around coal phase out. I mean, I know it precedes all of this, but I think it's really important just to acknowledge it with the coal phase out, Ontario um, is not just a leader in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, but that actually produced approximately $3 billion a year in health benefits for the province. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and next, we're going to go to Martin. Do you want to give yourself a little introduction? I will, certainly. I hope you can hear me okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Bro, and as you see there, I'm the Senior Director of Greenhouse Gas Reduction Technologies at the Ontario Centers of Excellence. Um, for those of you not familiar with uh, OCE, uh, we basically assist the province in the development of uh, the provincial economy by helping create new jobs, products, services, technologies, and businesses. And um, in partnership with industry, in other words, leveraging a lot of industrial funding, um, we co-invest to help and commercialize a lot of these innovations and, and work with uh, publicly funded colleges and universities and research hospitals. And I think when, when you look at it from that perspective, that really helps uh, demonstrate the types of programs that we're doing now, looking at the innovations on greenhouse gas reduction and um, the programs that uh, I, I'm running at OCE with our team is, uh, is the target GHG program, which was handling um, joint funding with university and, and collaborative research and development projects with NSERC, uh, pilot type projects, uh, doing uh, 
a little later stage research and development with uh, Sustainable Development Technologies Canada, and then the industrial stream looking at um, major industrial projects and partnerships with SME sectors and major emitters in the province, as well as assisting on um, the small, medium, and startup type projects with our Solutions 2030 program and the Carbon X Prize semifinalists. So that then those programs were originally launched in 2016, and we had some amazing announcements in 2017, which I'd be happy to get into a little bit further as we go into the uh, panel. But it uh, it has been followed up with the Green on Industries program, which is a 200 million dollar. Uh, program to help industry and large emitters reduce their emissions even further. And uh, also the uh, Green on Food and Beverage program uh, was announced some time ago and will be opening up for intake to help the food and beverage sector reduce their emissions. So uh, that's, uh, I guess, the start of it. And I, I think that, you know, listening to Kim's discussion on health, I think uh, you'll as we get a little further into the panel, I'd, um, I'd be happy to talk about some of the projects because a lot of these projects aren't just about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but they certainly help in everything from industrial hygiene to cleaner air, particulate reduction, uh, NOx and SO2 emissions on top of um, the actual reduction in greenhouse gases, but at the same time, um, adding to the provincial economy and creating jobs and such. So it's, it's quite a fantastic program and I'm happy to be here so I can tell everyone about it. Thanks, Martin. Sorry, I'm just having a couple couple difficulties with the screen sharing here, but sit tight. Uh, next, we're going to go to Nancy to do a little introduction as well. Thanks. Hi, it's Nancy Pilardi at the uh, Climate Change, uh, the uh, Environmental Commissioner's Office. Sorry, the screen just changed. <laughs> um, at the uh, Environmental Commissioner's Office, I'm the Senior Manager on the Climate Change File. Uh, the Environmental Commissioner's Office is, and we're an independent office of the Legislative Assembly, and we are required under the Environmental Bill of Rights to report annually on progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the province. Um, so we released our 2017 progress report just at the end of January for any of you who haven't seen it yet. Um, it's a fairly significant tome. And we reviewed a number of issues around um, progress that is being made. One of the things that we did look at also is um, the greenhouse gas reduction account and how the monies are being spent under that. Um, as I believe probably most of you know, there is a requirement under the Climate Act that the monies are used to reduce or support the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And so one of the roles that we play is to sort of look at where, where the money is being spent to ensure that they actually are being used uh, to, to reduce emissions in the province. Um, I've been at the office here for about 10 years and so have seen a number of ups and downs on the climate change file over the years. Um, so I'm very pleased to, uh, you know, see that the government has moved forward with putting a price on carbon. That's something that we've been calling for uh, for about as long as I've been here. Um, I'm going to stop there, and I think we'll probably get into Q&A, and I can answer any questions at that point. Great. Thanks, Nancy. And uh, Gabby, I think I've managed to uh, get you uh, started here if you want to say hello. Gabby, are you there? Okay, I've taken you off mute. And okay, well, hopefully we'll get that sorted so we can get you uh, jumping in. And Gabby, if you can hear me, and uh, I've taken your mic off mute, so just say hello whenever you possibly can and jump into the conversation. We do have Gabriella Calapos, who's the Executive Director of the Clean Air Partnership, uh, who is going to be joining us as soon as possible and uh, she'll be able to jump into the conversation. Um, so I'm gonna start off with our first question here to throw it out to everyone. And I'll just say whoever wants to, uh, to jump in and, and speak first who has an idea on this, please do. Um, so the first question I'm gonna ask is pretty broad. Uh, so what, in your opinion, uh, have been some of the most effective actions that Ontario has taken to mitigate climate change in Ontario? Does anyone want to take a stab at that one? I, I don't mind jumping in here. Great. Uh, Martin, Martin Bro here. Um, so I think certainly from the perspective of the industrial portfolio, some of the great work that's been done was announced back on December 8th. Um, 
and the that was the launch of the Target GHG program. That Target GHG program ended up, uh, you know, investing uh, about fifty-one million dollars, leveraged at, uh, you know, greater than two to one in some cases. In some cases, some of the projects at uh, four and five to one against the uh, against the ask on the Target GHG program, and it generated. A, Roughly 370,000 tons in GHG reductions from industry, uh, from roughly 51 million dollars in uh, in investment from the cap and trade program through the Green Investment Fund at the initial trial of that. So that um, that is a really interesting um, program, not only because the greenhouse gas emissions, but from an economic perspective, over 50 percent of the companies that um, invested in projects were multinationals that can choose to invest their money in other jurisdictions around the world and their and the Ontario domestic um, business units actually have to compete for that finite capital and when there's an opportunity to invest in Ontario that has uh, some matched funding that uh, that certainly helps tip the scale on the return on investment when these companies have shareholders that require them to make uh, the most uh, most sound investment choice, and uh, you know, just as an example of that, there are some large uh, steel and cement uh, manufacturing facilities that implemented biomass fuel substitutions, re resulting in emissions of some of them around 75 to 100,000 tons um, in annual reductions. Uh, there was a, a really interesting project with uh, General Motors and um, IGRS with uh, Walker Environmental. And that's actually taking landfill gas from the Walker Environmental uh, Landfill Site in Thorold, Ontario, and, sh and uh, building a three-kilometer private pipeline across the shared fence line between the two properties of the St. Catharines engine plant of General Motors, making that the greenest General Motors engine facility in the world. And uh, that is uh, that's certainly an amazing thing for them to be providing um, nearly half of their electricity demand and 100% of their heating requirement from landfill gas. So that's um, you know those are just some quick examples, but I think that uh, it shows that from an industrial side there's a lot of appetite. And when I look at the uh, type of applicants we have right now going into the uh, Green on Industries program, the uh, the first tranche of funding of the 200 million is looking like um, over a million tons of annual GHG reductions from that first uh, first batch of uh, projects that we're reviewing right now. So again, a, a fantastic opportunity that will uh, reduce significant GHG emissions, and in some cases, reducing uh, facility um, SO2 emissions, some of them between 30% up to over 90%. So very interesting um, additional benefits to not just uh, climate change aspects, but for uh, hygiene and industrial hygiene and the health of uh, Ontario residents living in the vicinity. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on that one? Some of the most effective uh, actions Ontario has taken uh, in, in the past year or so uh, to mitigate climate change? Um, I'll, I'll just jump in here. I mean, you know, obviously we all know about the coal phase out and you know, a huge significant reduction, which, um, you know, made a, made a, an enormous contribution to Ontario's GHG profile. But I think, as I alluded to in my introduction, um, I've been around the file in the province for about 10 years now. And I think really moving forward to put the price on carbon and then now with the use of the funds in terms of putting it toward uh, infrastructure projects, which which really um, are quite significant in allowing individuals to shift some of their behaviors, I think is, is, a, key, um, is a key benefit of how the money is being used. And so, for example, on cycling infrastructure, I mean, these sorts of infrastructure projects are really fundamental to um, enable people to make the transitions that we need to have happen. And so um, I think the decisions, you know, to, to, to put it towards uh, specific enabling infrastructure projects to allow people to shift behaviors is is really critical. I'll just stop there at that. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, it's Keith here. I, I would agree with with you, uh, Nancy. I mean, I mean, you know, the electric vehicle subsidies uh, piece has you know been so it's received some criticism, but you can see that it looks like it it's working, or though all the other EV policies are working, and that's why. 
sales increased by 120%. Uh, and I think that even though it might be expensive to get some of those um, first electric vehicles out there, it's about making the paradigm shift away from internal combustion engines and two EVs. And that means we need to see more on the roads, structure out there, all that kind of stuff. So I think that those programs are being really successful. And it's not just the EVs, but the Green Ontario Fund, I mean, they launched, they were trying to give out 100,000 uh, smart thermostats and the demand was insane. People really wanted these things, uh, was through the roof. And same thing for, I think, a lot of the incentive that the programs that the province has put out there. And, and the good thing is it's not just helping people with behavior change, but it's helping to provoke a conversation um, that all Ontarians can be part of about the solutions to climate change and, and the impacts that we have in our lives and the things that we need to do. And so I think um, it's really useful just from, from that perspective as well. Great. And Kim, do you have Oh, go ahead. Sorry, this is Martin, and I don't want to uh, interrupt, but I just thought just on that point you made quickly on EVs and, and stuff like that, I would agree that there's some fantastic work going on that. And so, some of the um, uh, real benefit I get to see at Ontario Centers of Excellence when looking at the types of applicants is that, you know, we've been able to help some really fantastic Ontario companies one of them that we announced back in December was a company, eCamion, based here in Scarborough, Ontario. And they're developing some of the next generation of charging systems that um, allow us to rapidly charge vehicles and overcome a lot of the grid restrictions that would otherwise apply that create issues when people are trying to site charging stations. So that's some fantastic new technology, as well as, um, you know, I, even though I can't discuss the name of this big oil and gas company, there is one that is very interested in discussions with us right now about um, deploying electric vehicle charging stations at their retail gasoline fueling stations, saying that they're an energy company, not just a gasoline company. So I think that whole shift in mentality and thought is really taking off. And those types of industrial um, uh, projects are going to help on that whole EV strategy to help drive uptake. Mm -hmm. And this is Kim, I'll just add to what others are saying. I think for us, that when we look at um, the fact that there's funding for retrofits of schools, apartment buildings, hospitals, and other kind of institutions where they may not have the funds to actually make the investment, but that there'll be kinds of, all kinds of benefits, both economic as well as greenhouse gas, we really support those as well, as well as the investment in, in um, infrastructure for electric vehicles. So, um, and, and cycling is kind of mentioned by, um, by Nancy as well. So we, we think those are very, very positive moves on the part of the government. Mm -hmm. I'm and not yeah. sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Oh my God. I'm all, all right. Perfect. Thank you Why very you much. Um, I just wanted to kind of clarify uh, also on that one too. I think that there's a important kind of um, balance that we're trying to achieve with regards to reducing these greenhouse gas emissions. There's uh, opportunities for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions right now where it's very clear for us in terms of how much money went in, how much GHG reductions we're achieving. But there's a lot of investment we need to do as an enabling investment in order to achieve longer term greenhouse gas emissions. And for example, you're looking at it from cycling invest in cycling infrastructure investments. It's really important that we invest in those cycling infrastructure because it's an enabling factor to achieving the modal splits that we know that we want to be able to achieve and we have to achieve in order to reduce our transportation emissions. But maybe in the short term we may not be getting those um, that, that modal split taking place until we reach a critical mass of infrastructure where we can see that taking place. So it is really important to kind of think about it as terms of just hard GHG emissions and how much we can achieve right now, but also to invest in the infrastructure and the ability and the capacity to help us enable us to reach our 2030 and 2050 targets. And yeah, thanks Gabby. Um, I think that's also a good point about there being a lot of are more long term. Um, so, you know, we are looking we are looking at this uh, climate change action plan at a pretty early stage. So there are going to be some programs that are just kicking off, some that are just starting to, to have an impact here and there. Um, so it is, you know, it's, it's a pretty early time to be looking into this stuff, but um, we're doing so nonetheless. Um, I want to move to our next question here, um, which is, you know, a lot of programs have been started um, and some have been more effective than others. Um, what do you think are some actions that maybe didn't get as strong of a start as the ones that we've been talking about? Um, so what are some of the, the less effective things that could have been improved or could be done better in the future? 
I'll just I'll just jump in here if I can. Um, so one of the things that we focused on in our report this year was the use of uh, subsidies for fossil fuel natural gas trucks, and we. Uh, I mean, you can read about it in our report, but we raised some concerns around whether or not subsidizing fossil fuel natural gas trucks will actually have a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, um, primarily because we look, you know, also at the upstream methane emissions and the global warming potential associated with methane emissions. And so, you know, as Kim indicated, um, you know, freight is one of the fastest growing, is the fastest growing uh, emissions sector in the province and so we really need to you know begin to tackle that sector and so um, you know we explored this a bit in the report but we did we did look at whether or not subsidizing fossil fuel natural gas trucks is, is going to have a significant impact and and you know landed on the side of saying well actually that we don't we don't think this one passes the sniff test um, the other thing that we talked about uh, and I'll stick to sort of what we, we talked about in our report is is um, as many of you know, the province is developing the offset protocols, and we went through what they're looking at and what they're developing. And some of those protocols we we thought were fine, and they 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 actually will result in real emissions reductions and offset. Um, but we did raise some flags with regard to the forestry offset, um, forest management offset protocols. And you know, I think the bottom line is is we have to think about in a cap and trade system that any time you offer offsets, you're, it is allowing emissions to go up from another emitter. And so we really need to be sure that uh, the emissions reductions associated with offsets programs are real. And so we did, um, so again, at least effective, I would say, um, you know, we pointed to some of those offset protocols and offset projects and said these probably won't be very effective. Um, and, and so those are two that I would highlight that we would say are, are sort of least I mean, they haven't obviously come out with the offset protocols, but we really cautioned, you know, raised, raised a red flag in that area. Right. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, anything else that uh, any potential improvements that anyone else sees? Hi, this, this is Kim, and, and maybe it's covered somewhere else in government budget, but I guess, again, just making the point that I made earlier, but it seems like transit seems so important in terms of modal shift and greenhouse gas reductions would produce all kinds of other health and social benefits in terms of social ac um, equity and um, air pollution reductions and that. And so I think for us, we'd like to see greater emphasis on that. Now, maybe the government thinking is that they're funding that in other places, but we do know there's still a shortfall in funding for transit, so that would be one. And then the other one, just that Nancy was kind of saying as well, kind of saying it again with freight. And I know it's a tough one. I don't know how you get at this, but some sort of policies that help us to shift back to rail or help to reduce the emissions from trucks that are on the road, that somehow those those need to be tackled. But I do appreciate that they're, they're tricky things to get at. Yeah, and I would just, I would just jump in here on the freight. I mean, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about is, you know, as you say, we're moving more to a, you know, delivery, you know, just in time delivery. So uh, system which does increase freight that's on the road. And so we talked, you know, about how we make it, you know, avoiding trucking where possible, making sure that the loads are fuller and complete, um, you know, improving the truck efficiencies. So the vehicles themselves and then actually getting them, um, you know, getting old diesel trucks off the road. And so trying to trying to put in incentives to uh, remove old diesel trucks from the road and then um, ultimately shifting away from fossil fuels looking towards um, you know renewable natural gas vehicles that are not um, tied into the tied into the grid uh, pipeline grids but um, one of the other things we talked about in that tra chapter which I was going to bring up later is you know, we we really do think that road pricing plays a significant role to start to shift transportation patterns and starts to, you know, again put a price on things that pe most people treat as relatively free. And so one of the, one of the recommendations that we have in there is, you know, is looking at road pricing in a distance-based kind of holistic way to try and shift those transportation patterns because. Um, you know, we all recognize that as long as the roads are, are open and available and free, that uh, and building more roads is not the way that we need to go. Right. Uh, and maybe right, Martin. Sorry, Martin, can I just pipe right, in on here. that one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 
Well, I just want to say while we're talking about freight, again, when we kind of look at these things from a health perspective, I mean, we all did this with coal, right? We really emphasized the immediate health co-benefits when we were pushing for the phase out of coal, even though the greenhouse gases were may have been the, the bigger goal for many of us. Um, I think when we think about freight, I think that there's there's all kinds of air pollution health benefits and health care savings that could be gained there. Um, but there's also um, probably, I think, safety issues. I, I bet that there's a lot of deaths and collisions on the highways that have to do with how much freight is actually being moved on our highways right now. So I like the idea of, of um, something like road pricing and that just, but I think it would be useful to actually look at what the actual health impacts are of freight being moved on our trains, looking at it in a holistic way. That would be interesting. Martin, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's a, I guess a comment and more so than something that could be improved. And I think one of, I think the, one of the challenges we have on working with industry is you're working with a lot of multinational companies that are all publicly traded. And one of the problems that kind of spins into the transportation side of things and getting into freight is that there are a lot of really interesting and intriguing things that the, some of these big companies are trying to do, but they want to keep it quiet until they are certain that the capital can be invested alongside the um, the incentives that are being offered through the cap and trade program, mainly for the reason of if they don't get the project, would that impact their share price kind of thing? And then they get uh, punished for trying to do a good project and then maybe not fully succeeding on getting the funding. So that said, they tend to keep quiet about it and you don't necessarily hear about some of these interesting projects that are coming down. If I just back up a bit to the comment before about um, compressed natural gas fueling, one of those interesting things is you run into a chicken and egg thing where we're trying to work on more and more renewable natural gas projects, but in light of here another gap in, in programs is in, in the absence of a renewable fuel standard that's fully developed that looks like it'll, that it probably won't be coming anytime immediately soon. Um, you, you run the challenge of this chicken and egg of how do you build a, a uh, RNG facility that will economically survive without having, say, vehicles to fill up because the best economic offset is that against diesel fuel that would incent vehicles to, to do that because it's the highest cost versus, say, you know, space heating with, with natural gas. So those are the kinds of things that I think we need to, the ecosystem needs to understand is in development. And I think that's something that the way these programs are designed and the way we're funding things with um, big industries, you, we won't hear about these things for like a year or two, always behind the behind a lot of the thoughts and processes that we're discussing now. Um, on top of that, though, what we are seeing when we get into freight, and if you look at things like um, container shipping plus aviation, uh, you add those two together and it's uh, a greater global emitter than the cement industry, which is the, the you know, holds the, the uh, spot for the number one single emitting industrial source. Um, so the, um, when you look at uh, that sort of um, the, the freight side of things, you, there are some interesting projects where you can, you know, manufacture diesel substitutes out of CO2 with hydrogen and manufacture chemicals like dimethyl ether, which can go directly into diesel engines that have a fuel system modification. And that reduces GHG emissions by about 30% per mile driven. Now that's not a hundred percent replacement, but what it is, is it's an opportunity like biodiesel to, um, to help reduce emissions from existing capital. And that would be diesel engines. Um, we're seeing a greater and greater desire for hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicles and um, Gold Corp was talking about this at the gap at the cap and trade program um, conference last week, where they're looking at deploying haul trucks that will be hauling from their brand new gold mine that they're deploying up in northern Ontario to haul between the uh, the gold mine and the and the uh, the mill to uh, haul it with hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So that would be a very interesting sort of way to create a demand. And the, uh, they're going to be uh, using the, the uh, clean uh, grid from Ontario to generate the hydrogen rather than uh, generating it from natural gas, which is uh, the typical way with steam methane reforming. So that's, there are things that are coming. And um, I think it's uh, you know, understanding that there is a pathway there and an encouraging businesses to know that that pathway is on the horizon so that the longer scale industrial capital cycles that are, you know, to be honest, 
working on um, you know reductions in GHG emissions from one facility that can equal 50,000 homes worth of natural gas. It's those kinds of scales that that encouragement is going to really make those big differences that we could probably do a bit better on the communication side. Thanks, Martin. Um, I also wanted to to touch on uh, Gabby. I know you've worked a lot with municipalities. We've been talking a lot about freight and businesses and um, and industrial emissions. But um, when we uh, you work with a range of municipalities, large and small, and how are these municipalities participating in the climate change action plan right now? And uh, and what kind of barriers are they facing, or uh, what kind of support are they getting as well? Thanks. Um, I just actually wanted to kind of go back to one of the, the conversations with relating to um, greenhouse gas emissions, public health, transportation, active transportation. One of the things I think that's really important, and I will go raise where how municipalities are participating, I just wanted to get a kick at the can on this one, is that um, when we were pitching, you know, when the whole coal phase out was being pitched, one of the game changers associated with that is because of an analysis looking at it from a comprehensive point of view is, okay, how much is it costing us to generate energy from coal? And then how much is it costing us in our public health care costs? They're coming from the same budget. Um, and I think that's one of the kind of challenges that we're facing in the transportation sector is because we are trying to build a business case on this one. And there are enough cap and trade funds out there to deal with our transportation challenges. We have to find a much more holistic way to take that into consideration the cost and benefits associated with this. So I do believe that one of the things missing and one of the um, weaknesses of the Climate Change Action Plan is its, its, um, its inability at this point in time, and it's still early, I get it, but that integration across um, various um, various ministries associated with okay, if we actually did this, what's the what if we actually kind of invested in public transit up to this amount of time? What's the what's the modal shift it will get us in the short term? What's the direction we're trying to go into in the modal shift in the long term? And what are the public health care benefits associated with reducing emissions from our transportation sources in terms of our public health care budget as well? And then how do we actually manage those those costs? Because I think that's one of the weak at this point in time is the integration across various costs um, uh, across ministries. So I would say that's kind of an area that I think would really be of value to do some research on in terms of doing an analysis associated with the healthcare costs associated with emissions from our transportation sector. That's my plug for that one. In terms of what municipalities are doing, um, municipalities are um, taking um, done a lot of work and a lot of advancements on their um, climate action planning or their community energy planning for their communities. Um, they're certainly from their own corporations. They are looking at opportunities to reduce their emissions from their own corporate fleets and corporate um, uh, facilities and, and there is um, progress taking place on that one. Um, uh, um, where we are struggling at the municipal sector is with regards to implementation of community climate action plans or energy plans. And that largely has to do with the fact that there is not going to be able to be funding this off the um, property tax base. It's just that's already tapped out and their ability to do this is really relying heavily on the cap and trade funds for providing the implementation supports that are needed on this one. And I think that's one of the, the key struggles. Um, municipalities are participating in the um, green, greenhouse gas and the climate change action plan, largely through the municipal champions fund, um, which the first round has been decided upon, and there's and they're just in the finalizing up the contracts for that. And the second round has just been announced, and they're certainly oversubscribed in terms of the amount that they have allocated um, for municipalities to be able to um, green, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. I think there's also a very strong policy framework that the climate change action plan is changes into the Municipal Act that provide more authority for municipalities um, and um, to uh, on climate change. Um, where it starts sh stop short is regard stop short of that is in in the Ontario Building Code. So we are relying at this point in time to seeing what happens with coming out of the Ontario Building Code. We have been working with trying to enable municipalities to um, have a mandated hot standard that's in the Building Code, but then um, maybe voluntarily in the Building Code that would then allow them to mandate that for their jurisdiction and move in, test out the market and accelerate the market and then be able to, the rest of Ontario being benefit, benefiting from those improvements in a smaller jurisdiction to test it out. Um, I think certainly from the perspective of engaging municipalities a lot on the community energy profile and, and their community energy planning and then really be able to use the um, cap and trade funds to um, work on the implementation of those plans is some of the key areas that municipalities are working forward on. 
Thanks, Gabby. Um, I wanted to go to one of our audience questions here because I know you've been waiting a little while. And uh, just a reminder to everyone who's listening, you can type in questions along the right-hand side in the questions section uh, of your panel here. So the first question, I'm going to throw this one to, uh, to Keith to start off, but anyone else who wants to weigh in, great. Uh, first question, uh, can you go over how the sales of 2020 vintages indicate, indicate long-term buy-in from cap-and-trade participants? OREG 144.16 shows that the first compliance period ends on December 31st, 2020. Yeah, that's a good point. Ontario made a mistake when they structured the auctions because the, the future vintages are supposed to be for a future compliance period, but because Ontario's first compliance period was a four-year period, when they sold future vintages that were three years out or four years out, they were actually in the same compliance period. Uh, but that said, I think I think we still still should take it as as um, a vote of confidence in the longevity of the system because um, people people um, you know are buying those permits today. Uh, they could buy them later, but later they will cost more. And if you think that the system is going to be struck down, then you know you're not going to be buying uh, those future vintages at all. Uh, also, I think we could ask some some questions about whether or not some of the auction participants understood that uh, they weren't really future vintages. They probably bought them under thinking that they were uh, because they were this, they thought the system was set up like other systems are. But but you're you're right to point out that uh, the province made a bit of an error. I'll say that now that we're in 2018. They're selling 2021 vintages, which are actually in the next compliance period. Hmm. Uh, any other panel participants want to weigh in on the uh, future vintages issue? Okay, then I will move on to our next question uh, from Jacqueline here. How well have programs that have targeted low-income communities done? I'll direct that one. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll aim it to Nancy first. Uh, Nancy, do you have any any thoughts on that? How well programs have targeted low-income communities in Ontario? Uh, I don't have good insight in that. We have requested, as you know, some of the initial funding from the um, the GIF, the original $325 million that was um, allocated did go to low income, but we don't actually, we've requested some of the information from the government on that, and we, I, we we're just talking about it about an hour ago, so I don't, I don't have the information at my fingertips right now, so I can't really comment. I, I can just add it's Gabby here. I just wanted to kind of raise on the, the there there certainly was part of the GIF. There was a um, a stream of funding that um, has gone out through um, Shape and Sharp um, from the Ministry of Housing. It was geared largely towards the lar the, so the larger buildings on social housing providers, so it wasn't necessarily kind of equitably um, spread across. Um, um, all of social housing in Ontario. Um, there's another um, Green on HSC program um, that was launched as well to looking at that kind of trying to fill that gap in the smaller social housing sector. There are still significant gaps in being able to um, um, the, the non-social housing and low-income programs. I mean, there's rebates and rebates that are available regardless of your income. What the challenge is for low-income housing is the upfront capital cost, and that's where financing is really, really important important and where we need to kind of move towards to address the upfront capital costs that will be a huge barrier for lower income households. And in, in addition, the non-municipal um, social housing sector is another gap in where we really need to develop programs to, um, to serve um, lower income. Thanks, Gabby. Um, and we are uh, we're getting towards the end here of our discussion. Um, I don't see any further. Oh, I do see one audience question that just popped up for Martin here. So I'm going to ask that one. Uh, Martin, I know you have to go in a couple of minutes, so we'll try to get this one under the wire. Uh, Martin, has Target GHG calculated the marginal abatement cost, uh, marginal cost per ton of the GHG reductions from the projects invested in? Sure. Um, so we calculate all of those. And to be fair, there's so first I'll just preface it with um, every project has a sort of different capital life. And sometimes that capital life on some of the projects is uh, maybe a 15 year project and sometimes it's a 30 or 40 year project. And so in order to do a, an apples to apples comparison, um, maybe this is arbitrary, maybe it's not. But we chose 2030 as a somewhat um, 
arbitrary capital lifespan for the project because it allowed us to compare projects apples to apples and also 2030 is the final signing date for all the WCI signatory uh, jurisdictions. So being that no, none of signed past that, that's as good as any other date for the comparative analysis. So from a 2030 perspective, and from the perspective of the investment from the province of Ontario, the return on investment, I guess, is in about the $15 per ton range, $15, $16 per ton. And uh, so that's what the uh, that's what it looks like from a, from an investment perspective, and that's in annual tons of production. So calculated by the total ask from the target GHG program. That's ask, not total capital, and um, and divided by the total greenhouse gas through 2030 as the for the calculation. Now, when I when we look at that going forward into the the next tranche of funding. Martin, you're, uh, you're cutting out a little bit there. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to go to the next question while that's happening uh, here. Quickly, Keith, uh, we had a request for you to share some of the actions that the province did not move forward with in 2017 as planned in the Climate Action Plan. Well, Sarah, maybe you can speak to that. But, but the, sh the short answer, I don't, I don't have the list in front of me, um, Heather, but Sarah did an exhaustive search of all the things in the Climate Change Action Plan that have move forward and those that have not. And we almost included that as part of this report, but then it was too much of a design challenge. <laughs> it, was, it was a very I'm long- Sorry, I, I'm, I'm back. If, um, if people want me to just uh, wrap it up, I can. Sure, well, yeah, Martin, do you want to say uh, a, a last goodbye and then we'll flip back to, uh, to the undone items question? I will indeed. So um, I just, uh, I'll just say before I have to go, my apologies for having to bail out here a couple of minutes early. So thanks for the opportunity to speak on the panel. I think that um, from a cost perspective, uh, you know, I think this is definitely good investment for the province. I jokingly say that the province could easily go buy a million tons of allowances at auction and drop $18 million on those allowances and then just simply retire them. But the impact to the, uh, to the market mechanism would be a massive detriment. Instead, investing in a way that delivers a, a relatively equivalent um, cost uh, per ton um, we can see jobs, prosperity, investment in the province uh, coming in from big multinationals offshore and, uh, and significant greenhouse gas reductions as well as, um, you know, all the uh, construction jobs and operational jobs that go with it. So I think, uh, I think the, the program is, seems to be shaping up quite well on the industrial side of things. And I look forward to seeing how those programs hopefully will persist after, uh, after what we see in June. Thanks, Martin. Great to have you on the panel. Um, just to go back to the question about uh, items that, that haven't been completed yet, um, and Keith did mention, we, I did make a very exhaustive, a very long spreadsheet uh, detailing which items have been promised for which years, which have been done, which have been initiated, which have had money associated with them. Um, so I will be making that available. Uh, it may not be pretty, but it will be made available probably in the next month as part of the Clean Economy Alliance website. Um, and we do actually have a new website uh, which will be launched. So um, pay attention to our emails. Uh, they'll be coming out and they'll be announcing uh, that. But so, I mean, there, there were a few items that we picked up just briefly. I know that um, there was a promise to have EV charging, over, free overnight EV charging um, that was gonna be happening earlier on and we're still holding on for that. There was a, the uh, home energy rating uh, system that, uh, that we were looking forward to as well. Um, and there's a few more in our reports that you can download on the right-hand side there. Um, so there's a little list of some of the items that we've been hanging on for uh, that haven't happened yet. And we do hope to see those happening in the future. Um, so we're, uh, we, have, we just have a few minutes left here. I wanna do a quick round, just give everybody uh, who's remaining a chance to um, give a, a last thought and a goodbye. So let's start with, uh, with you, Kim. Hi. I don't know if it's a fair thing to say, but I feel like I can't talk about the coal phase out. And I just want to say I was one of the people that actually helped with the coal phase out from 1999 to 2005. So I feel quite invested in it. Um, I'm very disappointed. I'm, I, I think there's so many things that have been done well, but very disappointed that we're reinvesting in nuclear energy at this point in time when there's been such advances in renewable energies. And um, I, I feel like it is related to this topic, although it's a little offside. 
That's okay, not to worry, Kim. Um, and uh, Gabby, do you want to give any uh, last thoughts here? Uh, hi, thanks. Um, I don't know if this is a last thought or anything like that, but one of the key things that I think is important to recognize is that a carbon pricing scheme isn't isn't gain, isn't geared towards gaining raising revenue. It's actually ga geared towards reducing re emissions, and I think that's one of the key things that we really need to kind of key messages that we need to get across during this time period is that the carbon pricing um, we have two different goals. The carbon pricing in itself at twenty bucks a ton is not anything close to what we need to actually achieve the greenhouse gas reductions that we have in, that we have ahead of us. If we wanted to actually just use the pricing mechanism to achieve the reductions, we're looking at carbon pricing in the range of 150 bucks a ton. So we all know that's not politically feasible. We really need to kind of um, highlight that I'm, like, I'm speaking for myself here, but I'm sure a lot of people will agree on this one. I think that it's much more important to have a lower price at this point in time and reinvest it in, in building the capacity capacity, the infrastructure, the reductions we need on the short term and the long term, and then ideally the price will come up, but that it won't hurt people as nearly as much because they're not as vulnerable because their emissions are lower, and then ultimately then the market mechanism associated with a carbon price can actually achieve the, the, the deeper reductions um, over the course of time. But at this point in time, I think that there's a, mis, a miscommunication that people think that um, carbon pricing, that it's revenue neutral versus reinvestment is the same thing and will achieve our reductions, and that is not the case at all. It is about reinvestment at this early stage of the game is critical to being able to kind of move us in the direction of deeper reductions in the way we need to go. Thanks Gabby, that's a very good point. Uh, Nancy, any last thoughts? Um, the, the last thoughts I would uh, contribute would be um, looking as we do across the government at how the government is doing writ large on the climate change file. I think two things I want to make note of here. One is with respect to the recent decision on the long-term infrastructure plan. And I think that was something that we were really pleased to see is that it now includes um, low carbon procurement and the considerations of when government is doing infrastructure to look at the low carbon procurement um, as a factor and when it makes its decision. So that's one that is sort of outside of uh, MOECC's bailiwick, but is really a strong signal moving forward. And the other one that we've we've raised concerns about is the long-term energy plan. And um, we've pointed out on numerous occasions that the long-term energy plan is really a long-term electricity plan. And there needs to be real alignment between the long-term energy plan as a true energy plan, not just an electricity plan, and the targets that are outlined in the Climate Act. And so sort of taking a 30,000 foot level view of things, we need to see that cross alignment uh, made stronger across ministries um, to really continue to drive this issue across all, all, all government. Thanks, Nancy. And Keith, any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, just, I mean, that we tried to produce some support to get some facts out there. So please spread the facts. We created some infographics about job creation during 2017, about GDP growth during 2017, about electric vehicle sales up all good news stories. Uh, we want people to share them. Uh, you can share them on, on Twitter, or I think we sent them via email, but you can also, you know, write letters to the editor, get out there. If you're at, you know, debates, people are talking about carbon pricing and whether it kills jobs. We know for a fact it hasn't. It hasn't done so in any other jurisdiction and it hasn't done so here in Ontario. 155,000 jobs added during the first year of cap and trade. We all, we all should be holding on to that fact and shouting it as loudly as we can. Thank you, Keith, uh, and, and thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Uh, thanks for sticking around, and um, thanks to everyone who attended as well and, uh, and listened. Uh, this has been recorded, so uh, you will be emailed a copy of the recording as soon as it's downloaded, uh, all of our uh, attendees. And uh, you can also head to our website at uh, queeneconomyalliance.ca. My email address is now up on your screen, so you can always email me if you have any questions uh, or comments or thoughts. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a good one. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.